Good evening, everybody. Uh, good morning for someone. So thank you very much for joining us today to attend our first webinar for Lipedema Awareness Month. I'm here with Sherry Fetzer, and we would like you to know that as you are aware or might be aware of, there are still um, a lot of points of concern in lipedema. And uh, we, as patient association, would like to contribute to the diffusion of best practice in lipedema management. And so we have decided to get together and advocate for proper treatment and proper information and through this uh, webinar series. So we are the three association. We are, it's me for uh, Leo Lipedima Italia, Lipedima UK, and I'm Limfa from Portugal. And we three are bringing together our effort to organize this uh, joint web event series for Lipedema Awareness Month that are intended to be live streamed worldwide in uh, different languages through our social media channels. So it's uh, Leo Lipedima Italia is represented by me, that is Valeria Giordano and Marcella Ojano, uh, Sherry Fetzer and Kate Foster on behalf of Lipedima UK and Manuela Lorenzo Marquez. Did I say it well, Manuela? Please say me that. <laughs> From uh, and Limpa. So thanks for having us uh, uh, today. Um, well, Let's get right into the event, but before, um, allow me to thank you, our wonderful donators who made all of this possible. So thank you to Human Med, to Yuzo, Chizeta Medicali, Solidea, and Medi UK. So now let's move forward. We have to present our special guest tonight. Tonight we are going to know what's going on in lipedema and uh, be informed about research updates. So let me introduce you a person that actually in the lipedema world doesn't need any presentation. So Dr. Karen Herbst, thank you for being here with us today. Dr. Karen Herbst is one of the most remarkable voices in the international lipedema research and treatment. She's been working with women with lipedema for over 15 years and has many publications on lipedema and other connective tissue disorders. So um, she's a passionate about finding new treatments for lipedema towards a real cure. She's currently the medical um, and uh, research director of Total Lipedema Care. And now I'll hand over, hand over to Sherry. Thank you very much. Sherry, to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Valeria. I'd like to um, particularly introduce Dr. Thomas Wright, who is another American, and we're very, very grateful to make this an international event. So thank you very much, Karen and Thomas, for joining us today, because we we really want this to be a participation of all, all people from all areas. Um, Dr. Wright has published six peer-reviewed manuscripts on lipedema and related fat tissue disorders. He's worked with Dr. Karen Herbst on the first ever recently published guidelines in the US the US standard of care guidelines for lipedema, which really is a major step forward. And thank you very much for all the work you both put into that. Dr. Wright is also collaborating with the Washington University School of Medicine and the Lipedema Foundation. Again, really, really important forward thinking work. And the study there is um, going on to better understand lipedema tissue resistance to weight loss, which is something we all struggle with and know only too well, and a better understanding of the biological, biology sorry, of lipedema, which again um, is so necessary. I mean, every patient is craving this information and um, waiting to see what you find. And he is, Dr. Wright is very passionate about bringing attention to this disease. So we are internationally very grateful for all your, all your efforts. Um, I just mentioned that all of our webinars will be recorded, so they'll be available to watch again on our various websites, and we welcome everybody sharing them as much as possible on other websites and social media. Um, our aim is to learn from the very best worldwide, and it's wonderful to kick off with you two such reputable and wonderful people. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. So, Valerie, what's what's our next stage? <laughs> I think that we can give the word to who who is starting, Dr. Herbst or Dr. Wright, who of you. I think I'll go ahead and start. That's okay. Okay. So we're almost listening to Dr. Herbst, and um, do you have the slides for Dr. Herbst, please? Okay. So I will leave you, Dr. Herbst. <laughs> it's yours. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. Okay. So thank you so much for the invitation to speak uh, from both of you, but also from Amlimpa as well. And Tom and I um, decided that we wanted to talk about new research in the area of lipedema, and I'm going to focus on inflammation to start. Here's my disclosures. So lipedema is an inflammatory disease, and I will prove that to you in a few minutes, but I just wanna start with, with this, this statement. And the reason is because I want to uh, begin to try and understand the in inflammation process. So here is a cartoon of what inflammation looks like. And inflammation starts with something, some sort of, um, infection or an injury and the immune cells recognize the infection or the injury and they start secreting things they secrete messages to bring in other cells from the immune system they actually um, try to kill infections if they can find it and they uh, may also try and um, to reduce the the damage in the tissue and the first cells that encounter an injury or an infection are mast cells or neutrophils. And then from there, if the inflammation resolves, then macrophages come in and macrophages come in and clean up the mess. So they're gonna um, pick up all of the debris and they're gonna return it to the uh, body and it will be degraded and then reused. And then the body enters what's called adapted homeostasis. So it goes back to what it should normally be doing. It, homeostasis means just normal functioning in the body. However, there is this concept that in the weeks to years after the inflammation completely resolves, that the tissue that has been damaged or injured is predisposed to develop chronic inflammation again. And um, some of you might um, think of examples of this. Um, so if you, if you get sick and you have um, an old knee injury that's doing just fine, when you get sick, you start to feel pain in your knee again. So there's some kind of memory within tissue and part of this memory may be in immune cells. And one type of immune cell is called a T cell. And these uh, T cells can be memory cells. So they remember that there was an infection, which is really important. If they see the infection again, your immune system immediately responds and gets rid of the infection faster than in the past. But could it be that there are some memory cells within uh, our tissue that can remember the presence of inflammation, including that of lipedema? Now, if the, if the inflammation does not resolve, then the body enters what's called maladapted homeostasis, where you have chronic inflammation, autoimmunity, and also fibrosis. And it could be in lipedema that there are areas with adapted homeostasis and maladapted homeostasis. So I mentioned that there was inflammation in lipedema tissue, yes. So there are uh, two studies that have looked at the immune cells in lipedema tissue. In the first study, they showed that there are increased number of white blood cells, and this marker CD45 plus is a marker of just general white blood cells, and they were elevated in lipedema tissue compared to controls. And then they also looked at macrophages, which were elevated compared to controls. So could it be that in lipedema tissue, we're in a, just a chronic uh, maladaptive resolution phase of inflammation? In the second study, they looked at women with lipedema who had uh, obesity, so a body mass index greater than 30, or not obesity with a body mass index less than 30. And you can see 
in the lipid edema tissue, it doesn't matter whether you have obesity or not, there are increased macrophages in the tissue. So something is definitely going on related to inflammation. And I'm sure you all remember this study when it came out, platelet factor four. So platelet factor four is a marker of inflammation. It's very well known as a marker of inflammation of the gut. And you can see that in controls, the, there are, are not very high levels of platelet factor four, but in secondary lymphedema, lymphovascular disease, and lipedema, the platelet factor four levels were higher, suggestive of inflammation. So the question is, are platelet factor four levels higher in women with lipedema because they have obesity? And the answer is no. You can see down here that in, in uh, con controls that did not have obesity and controls that had obesity, platelet factor four levels were normal. You have to have some kind of lymphatic disorder to see elevated platelet factor four, four levels, at least in this study. So a second marker of inflammation. And here's a third one. So this is a study that just came out uh, this year, a couple of weeks ago, and they looked at a marker called CD11C. And this is a marker suggesting if it's high, that there's more immune cell infiltration. And you can see they looked at controls, the abdomen or the thigh in patients who had lipedema and immune cells are much higher in the thigh compared to controls. Uh, what I think is interesting is it was also elevated in the abdomen compared to controls, but it did not reach significance, but maybe with a few more women in the study, it would have. And finally, we know that if you have inflammation, that your body is trying to resolve it and it tries to fill it in with scar tissue. So if you look at control tissue here, compared to lipedema tissue, you see a lot more pink in the lipedema tissue. That means there's fibrosis or scar. And they quantitated it over here on the right. There are lower amounts of fibrotic tissue in controls compared to women who have lipedema. So you've got the whole process going on. You've got inflammation, resolution of inflammation, and fibrosis. So what is causing the inflammation in lipedema? Could it be injury? Could it be infection? So I'm gonna talk about how fluid enters tissue to prepare for the next part of the talk. So the heart pumps blood through the arteries, arterioles, down into the capillary, where the capillary has holes in it that allows fluid and nutrients to enter the tissue. Right after the capillary, there's a small vessel called the post-capillary venule. And the post-capillary venule is part of the vein system that returns blood back to the heart. But the post-capillary venule is very responsive to the environment, especially to metabolic mediators and things that come out of immune cells like histamine, for example. So if you have a lot of histamine in your body, it's gonna act here to increase the amount of fluid that enters the tissue. The fluid that enters the tissue is all picked up by the lymphatic vessels, which return that fluid back to the veins and everything is recycled. So here's a happy little cell down here. It's got plenty of oxygen. It has just enough fluid and food around it. Um, so it's got normal oxygen. We call that normoxia. But here's a very sad cell. It has way too much fluid around it and it's not able to get access to its oxygen. And we call that hypoxia. And with COVID going on now, I think we all know the term hypoxia. So these cells send out a signal, help. And that signal is HIF1 alpha. And that stands for hypoxia inducible factor one alpha. And when you have that factor around secreted by cells that are in trouble, you get more blood vessels and more lymph vessels because your body wants to get oxygen to those cells and it wants to remove the excess fluid. You get more immune cells, so you get inflammation and you get increased adipose tissue. And that's very much so sounds like lipedema. So is there a problem with the small vessels in lipedema? So in this study, they looked at how dilated the, the small vessels are. And if you make vessels really fast, you don't make them very well, and they tend to be dilated and leaky. And sure enough, when they looked at 
uh, vessels from women who had lipedema or controls, there were more dilated vessels in the ladies who had lipedema than the controls. So check, we, we've got that. And this is an old study showing a capillary vessel here and inside it uh, is a circle are the red blood cells. And you can see outside here is fluid. So this capillary, <coughs> excuse me, is leaking fluid into the tissue. And if you look at the walls of the capillary, they're thick. Capillary walls are super thin. They are only one cell thick. And you can see they're, they're thickened here, suggestive of inflammation. So again, something's wrong with the capillary. And that post-capillary venule that I told you about that responds to metabolic mediators like histamine, you can see that it's very dilated. So it's probably pouring fluid into the tissue as well. And we wanted to uh, look at this further and not just look at one patient. So we looked at um, 21 patients who um, had lipedema and 21 that did not. And we did biopsies of the skin because you can see a lot about the body in the skin. And you can see um, here's a, a blood vessel with a star on it, a white star. And then here's an extension of that vessel. It's a white star as well. And you can see the space around those vessels. That space is fluid. So these vessels are leaky. And what does the, the body do when there's um, leakiness um, in the tissue? It sends an immune cell. So you can see all these black dots are increased immune cells in the tissue. And finally, you can see these round cells here. These are endothelial cells that have become round. And that's not good because if they're round, they've actually opened up a whole area where fluid and other parts of the uh, blood can just leak directly into the tissue. And that's actually shown over here, more leaky vessels in uh, women who had lipedema compared to controls. And these are age matched and BMI matched controls. So they're very well matched. So this is um, again, a study that just came out and I'll, I'll walk you through it. It's a little complicated, but I promise you, you'll get it. So what they did is they took um, liposuction uh, tissue and they digested it up and they got rid of all the fat cells. So any, any mature fat cells was, is gone. What's left is a mix of stem cells, fibroblasts, immune cells, endothelial cells, any cell that you can think of that's gonna be in fat tissue. And then what they did out of those cells was they pulled out the endothelial cells. So these are the cells that, that make blood vessels. And then he put them into a culture dish and they said, okay, grow and the endothelial cells grow up and cells like each other. So endothelial cells grow towards each other and they form what's called tight junctions. And that's shown in red and the endothelial cells are shown in blue. Then they taught, um, then they used artificial intelligence uh, through a computer program and, and said, um, hey computer, we want you to recognize what a good tight junction is. So when endothelial cells bond together, is that a really good bond or is it not? And what they anticipated was there may not be good bonds in lipedema. So they, they said, if it's not a good bond, it's more like lipedema. If it is a good bond, it's more like control. And they did a lot of this testing in order to, to generate that artificial intelligence program. And you can see here that the artificial intelligence program on the top three, which are all control endothelial cells, says, yeah, it's more likely to be a control in all three cases. And when you look at the bottom, which are endothelial cells from patients who had lipedema, you can see that the artificial intelligence said, hey, this is more likely to be leaky, so therefore it's more likely to be lipedema. Okay, so from this we can say, yeah, it looks like lipedema tissue is more likely to be leaky than control. So then what's interesting is they ask the question, well, why is it leaky? So they took that strom stromal vascular fraction, which is again, just the cells left over after they digest fat tissue and get rid of mature fat cells. Then they took normal human endothelial cells that you can buy from a company and they grew them up in a culture dish. And when you grow up these cells, you, you cover them with, with a liquid and that liquid is, is chock full of nutrients. And they let the, uh, the human endothelial cells grow and then they took the stromal vascular fraction 
and they added it from control cells, and that's the top panel, and or from lipedema cells, and that's the bottom panel. So the same type of human endothelial cells are growing, but the top panel has fluid from control cells. The bottom panel has fluid from lipedema cells. And here's the machine learning. It says in the top panel, very likely that these are very good tight junctions, again, shown in red with the endothelial cells shown in blue. Whereas on the bottom, which is your lipedema fluid, it shows that very high percentage uh, chance that these are leaky vessels. So the message from this study is that there's something that's being secreted by the lipedema tissue cells that is causing that microvessel leakiness. So now we're on to something. And this data all supports data from the 70s and 80s showing dilation of blood capillaries under the skin, immune cells around blood vessels, fibrosis of arterioles, and fibrosis and dilation of the venules. So this, this is, is not new, but I think it's really strong evidence that we're on the right track to figuring out lipedema. So if we look at the uh, inflammation process again, we've got leaky blood vessels and we have to figure out what's causing the leak. So what is in that fluid that's being secreted by the lipedema tissue? So I made a list here. It's definitely not um, inclusive. So there's, there's things that I'm missing from this list, but these are all mediators that can cause leakage from endothelial cells. And some of these things that you're, you're gonna recognize like histamine from mast cells or thrombin involved in clotting or substance P involved in pain, that's very interesting or sphingosine 1-phosphate, which is secreted often by parasites. So if the parasites, which are cells that hold the vessel shape, they can either make it smaller or larger. Um, if those are damaged, then of course, you're gonna have leakiness of vessels and a whole bunch of other things. So it may, maybe what um, is important in lipedema pathophysiology is on this list. Maybe it's not. Another thing I just wanna point out on this list is that the extracellular matrix can actually cause leakiness. So maybe damage to the extracellular matrix is releasing things causing uh, vessel leak leakiness. And then that damage in the extracellular matrix is where things start. So it could, you know, why, why does lipedema get worse in some women than others? So maybe underlying all of lipedema are these leaky vessels, but there are other things that can contribute. For example, could the small vessels actually be weak and then they get the signal to be leaky and then all heck breaks loose. So we know that many women with lipedema have hypermobile joints or hypermobile connective tissue. And you say, but, but if you look at a capillary, it's only an endothelial cell, it's not connective tissue. Well, this is a picture of an endothelial cell and you can see the little holes in it where nutrients, oxygen and fluid enter the tissue, but around it, is connective tissue. So that, that endothelial cell is just not sitting there flapping in the breeze on its own. It's held in place by connective tissue fibers. And so connective tissue fibers outside the cell are connected to connective tissue fibers inside the cell. So cells themselves have connective tissue in them. So even a capillary can be involved in a connective tissue disease. So why does lipedema happen on the lower part of the body? Well, when you stand, fluid in your trunk drops down into your hips, thighs, buttocks, and lower legs. And that increases the pressure within the vessels. So if you have a vessel that's already weak and you increase pressure in it, it may leak more. Then you add on that some sort of uh, secreted product that's also causing more leak. And so there, there may be multiple reasons why there's just this chronic leakage from small vessels into the tissue and why it more often affects the lower body than the upper body. So we've got weak capillaries and associated connective tissue and even weak postcapillary venules. We've got inflammation, so something that's being secreted. And in addition, I'm just gonna add in there, they, there may be venous hypertension 
venous insufficiency, so high pressure within the veins that's causing that postcapillary venule to leak, to leak. All this leads to increased lower body pressure in the vessels, and that equals lipedema. So here's our inflammation uh, process again, and I wanted to just state again. So in the weeks to years after complete resolution, the tissue is predisposed to developing chronic inflammation, and this suggests the presence of tissue immune alterations or memory cells. So some kind of memory cell in our tissue that may be present um, when lipedema first occurs in the body. So could memory cells be important in lipedema pathophysiology? So I want to introduce this concept of microchimerism. So when a woman is pregnant, she transfers immune cells and stem cells to her child. So it crosses the placenta during pregnancy. And if she breastfeeds that child, she can also transfer T cells to the child in that way. So as an adult, one out of every 5,000 of your T cells came from your mother. So again, the question I ask is why do some women get worse lipedema than other women? Could it be that if a woman had lipedema early on in her life and it was uh, rather severe and then she had a child, could she have passed on to her child these T cells, which are memory cells of her lipedema? So in some cases, could memory cells induced by lipedema in mothers pass to their daughters? And this certainly um, doesn't hold for women who have lipedema who, who um, uh, do not have, you know, they, they don't have any children, um, but it's in other uh, members of their family and, and they don't know where it comes from. But if it, and it, it also doesn't align with women who say it came through their father. But, <coughs> but um, could it have any influence at all on, on lipedema? So with this new knowledge, what's the treatment? So I think it's important to identify lipedema early and treat to prevent inflammation. If we can treat to prevent inflammation early, we not only improve quality of life, but we may also inhibit the generation of those memory cells. And then women won't be, um, won't be able to pass those memory cells down to their daughters if that is indeed a true mechanism uh, important in lipedema. And I would love to hear from all of you. This is certainly just a concept I'm throwing out there, and I think it's really all for uh, discussion. We don't have any proof. And I think it's really important if you have lipedema or you have a patient with lipid <coughs> excuse me, lipedema that you need to reduce known sources of inflammation. And they're all around us, as you know, some of which are very difficult to avoid, like um, unhealthy buildings that you work in, um, you get on public transportation, someone's wearing um, perfume that um, you're allergic to, any kind of environmental toxin in your toothpaste, your lotion that you put on the bo your body, your shampoo, what you wash your dishes with. Um, things that you can control um, in part are insulin resistance, so prediabetes, and that is to keep your non-lipedema obesity down as low as possible. And um, you do this through, um, you know, you know, eating the right food, exercising, um, supplements, working with your healthcare providers. Um, sleep apnea can cause inflammation, liver disease, surgery can cause inflammation, any kind of trauma, um, including emotional trauma. Depression can increase uh, inflammation in the body. Eating inflammatory food, you know, definitely get your veins checked out to see if they have inflammation. Autoimmune thyroid disease, which is common in lipedema, can um, be a source of inflammation, allergies, mast cell activation disease, PCOS, and inflammation in the gut. So testing for metabolic disease includes a hemoglobin A1C, which is often normal in women who have lipedema. So I like to check a fasting insulin and glucose level, and then I calculate what's called the HOMA index. And you could just look, look this up online. There's a bunch of HOMA calculators, and it's basically fasting insulin, times fasting glucose all over 22.5. And, 
And a value of one is normal. Anything above one suggests insulin resistance. Anything above two is concerning. You can also do an oral glucose tolerance test with your healthcare provider. Check a lipid panel. So your healthcare provider would be able to help you interpret that. Um, check your waist size, your blood pressure, your liver function and enzymes. And I, um, if I see any fat on the abdomen in, in my patients with lipidema, I like to look at a right upper quadrant ultrasound. That's just looking at the right, up, right upper part of the abdomen and we check for fatty liver. And the reason for that is the liver produces 25 to 50% of the lymph that flows through the thoracic ducts. So it can produce half of all the lymph fluid in your body. If you have anything like fatty liver, fibrosis, cirrhosis, this increase the amount of fluid that's being uh, generated by the liver. So definitely important to work on, on getting your liver fat down to normal. And when you get that right upper quadrant ultrasound to identify fatty liver, you can move on to get what's called a non-contrast MRI, and that will actually quantitate the amount of fat in the liver. This is most often done um, by uh, in research. Um, it's actually rather expensive, but it can definitely, if you have a lot of fat in the, in the liver, um, it may be a good idea because it can also identify fibrosis. Um, this is a, a study that came out last year saying lipidema can be treated non-surgically, a report of five cases. Then uh, Dr. Amato et al. used an anti-inflammatory diet or uh, alone or followed by a low-carb diet, aquatic exercise, manual lymphatic drainage, and a number of antioxidant supplements that we've been recommending for years, has, um, diazomin, quercetin, pycnogenol, flavonoids, ruticides, and butcher broom. And they actually had really good results, so I recommend um, looking up this paper. And it's only five people, um, but it's a really good sign that you can do things um, even before you have surgery to uh, uh, reduce your inflammation and reduce non-lipidema tissue. And I really do believe that um, surgical treatment should not be performed in the inflammatory phase of the disease, and this group feels the exact same way. So we, you can also do what many of you are already doing, the compression garments, um, intermittent pneumatic compression devices or pumps, exercise of any kind, healthy eating, and the use of medications and supplements with your healthcare provider. And Surgery can reduce inflammation in lipidema tissue, but again, make sure to reduce any inflammation prior to surgery, otherwise you're adding on insult to injury. And some people may have overactive immune systems that may make surgery difficult, and that includes mast cell activation disease. So my concluding remarks, lipidema tissue has leaky microvessels. This is, um, I think this is now firm, I, I'm, this is, been shown in multiple studies, this is um, a real thing. And hypermobile joint syndrome and possibly inflammatory vein disease or hypertensive vein disease may contribute to le lipidema leakiness through those postcapillary venules. And mast cell activation disease may also contribute through the generation of histamine. And hypoxia and inflammation in lipidema tissue is chronic. So controlling inflammation is paramount in the treatment of lipidema. And just finally, that concept of microchimerism, um, which I hope generated some um, or will generate discussion, um, might be important in lipidema. And what does that mean? It, it doesn't mean we should not have um, children in pregnancy. It means let's get control of lipidema early. Thank you so much and happy Lipedema Awareness Month. Thank you very much, Dr. Herbst, for this uh, amazing presentation. Thank you very much. We have a lot of questions, but I think that we can uh, give the word to Dr. Wright and then move to the question. Thank you, Dr. Wright. Well, thank you for having me, and I really appreciate this. And, and what a wonderful talk. I, I have to echo what a wonderful talk for uh, Dr. Herbst gave us. Uh, I learned so much from her, and um, and it just is so, um, I mean, just really 
really interesting and novel uh, thinking. Um, so um, I'm going to go ahead. Let me let me see if I uh, do. I have the right screen up. I'm going to put it in uh, presentation mode here. And um, are you guys? Can you guys see me? Okay. All right. I'm just going to. I'm. Um, I, I, I'm going to try and minimize this so I can see uh, you guys are you guys. All right. So I'm just going to uh, assume that you can see me OK. Um, all right. So here we go. So uh, I my so I'm also uh, talking to, you know, for Lipedema Awareness Month. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, several issues that I, uh, I'm passionate about um, non uh, um, <clears throat> And some of this is supported by a um, is is my research that was supported by Tactile Medical. Um, so let's see here. I'm having a little issue here. What's that? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, compression and um, uh, so compression garments. Um, and intermittent compression uh, pumps um, in lipedema is what I'm first. So um, Atan um, uh, found that uh, complete decongestive therapy uh, com uh, with wraps and compression uh, leads to significant decrease in limb size and also the intermittent compression pumps uh, decrease limb size. And then also found exercise plus um, the CDT and IPC uh, led to decreased pain, improvement in social functioning, fatigue, and other health measures. And then I'm also going to share. Uh, I'm I'm basically going to share that I've replicated some of those some of those things and added a little bit to it. Um, so so this is this is uh, data um, from. From my study, uh, showing that there was a significant decrease just from intermittent compression pump in in um, in um, in size in in in, in limb size um, um, with um, you know losing um, uh, is that the calf uh, losing uh, over a, uh, around a centimeter um, um, and um, and then, um, and when it's, um, <clears throat> and then the next slide showing this is this is looking at at all different areas uh, the um, the decrease in 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 circumference. Uh, this is from this is so um, on so in dark blue is just with compression uh, off the shelf compression uh, garments. Primarily, uh, e you know, either a combination of layered compression, like a knee-high and a capri, or a compression pantyhose, and so you, you're seeing uh, just the compression is leading to a significant uh, decrease in ankle, calf, knee, thigh, um, and uh, hip and waist. Uh, the compression pumps caused a further decrease in all of the um, in, in all of the regions, uh, except uh, at the hip, they actually increase in um, in um, adding the compression pumps actually cause an increase in size at at the hip. Um, and so this is this is uh, from at Atten, and um, he also saw uh, decreases in, in in limb volume. The most the the midline it, the group two is with the complete decongestive therapy. But even just exercise and even um, and um, exercise um, plus um, um, compression uh, exercise plus compression pump also uh, led to decreased uh, limb, limb size in both the left and right limbs, and and he sh he showed um, all these things the, the the pump the exercise and and the uh, comp compression wraps. All decreased the um, the pain uh, the lipedema ladies uh, experienced. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about extracellular water and um, 
So extracellular water is composed of plasma, interstitial water, and lymph. So um, now the plasma volume is very tightly regulated and really doesn't change. Um, so when I'm going to show the changes in extracellular water, it's really just changes we're seeing in, in lymph and interstitial uh, water. So the same in the in the same pa patients, same lipedema ladies, uh, they had uh, that the compression uh, plus the pump or to the compression alone um, led to decrease um, in in extracellular water or, or measured. We're really measuring here the extracellular water to um, to total water and uh, ratio, and so that led to so. So this is really important because, you know, there's been, there are, there's, you know, we, we know uh, the European consensus said that there's no edema. So um, in lipedema, but if you're seeing a decreased, so, so even just immediately applying the compression pump, um, you're seeing a decrease in the limb size, and immediately you're seeing a decrease in extracellular water. I mean, I mean, I don't. I, I mean, obviously that's fat doesn't change that quickly. It's got the water change is 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 there. There has to be edema in this, and it's it's obviously either in in the lymph or in the um, in the lymph compartment or. In, more likely also also lymph and interstitial compartments. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about the biology of lipedema fat. So, I mean, everybody listening here has, has probably already noticed lipedema tissue grows out of proportion or 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 or, or, or persists even when when weight with weight loss or or is increases out of uh, uh, um, out of proportion to the rest of the body. I mean, that's really one of the hallmarks of lipedema. And so what we already know is this, this adipose tissue is different. Um, we can look at it if you, if you take it out surgically. When I'm, when I, when I operate, I, I look at this fat. It looks different than, than non-lipedema fat. Um, it's more nodular. It's more fibrous. And, and it's tendon, and and this is just a picture of it. Um, and so even before we look at it under a microscope, we know it's different. But um, when when we um, this study uh, is by Ishak and uh, and was published last year, and uh, shows that there's different tissue signaling going on in in uh, in in the lipedema tissue. And these differences in terms of their gene expressions, uh, the cellular components, metal, met, metabolic products, and propensity for proliferation. So, um, and and we're going to go into maybe there's a, maybe a candidate gene that might be involved. And um, so, it, it, you know, this is really um, this really this as we go through this evidence, I, I want I want to try and convince you this. That the lipedema uh, fat tissue is um, is is different um, from the uh, uh, obesity fat tissue. So this is the so on the on the right here is a picture of the um, of the of the uh, heat map. So this is these are just this is mRNA mRNA gene expression, and you can see. Um, uh, blue is 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 decreased um, expression gene expression, and the red is increased. And these are uh, z scores or, or, or magnitudes of, of difference in in um, each color gradation. So the lipedema tissue here uh, um, in you know the uh, the first. Um, you know, 50 uh, genes is uh, decreased uh, in compared to non-lipedema; those are increased. And then another another set of genes, the uh, lipedema fat is increased, and uh, and the non-lipedema fat. So there's there's quite a 
quite a difference in what genes are turned on um, and what are, are turned off. Um, and now, the, and then if you look at the li, uh, lipedema fat cells, they're gonna they're gonna be different um, in terms of even their their composition. So they're gonna have different um, uh, phospholipids. So gly, uh, glycerophospholipids and sphingolipids um, are gonna be um, different. They're gonna have different compositions or different um, relative amounts. So uh, up here, and these are just, I mean, it's not really important exactly which of these phospholipids are, are increased in expression um, in lipedema and um, versus non-lipedema or decreased in expression. But, but, but you can see here, there's just, if you plot out what the lipid composition of these cells are they're they're very different um, and so uh, now looking next at at stem cells um, and so um, and these you know st this graph over here c29 and c34 positives uh, that 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 is what they used as a marker for stem cells and you can see here that the lipedema uh, tissue had a a dramatically increased um, number of, of, of stem cells in it compared to non-lipedema. And just, just a quick reminder, stem cells are, are, are cells that can continuously do not divide and renew themselves. Um, so they can go, they can become uh, other, either supportive, uh, supportive tissue or mature fat cells. So they can go different, different in their, they can perpetually uh, renew themselves. So if, if a stem cell is going to become a fat cell, um, it's going to get fat droplets in it. Um, and so, uh, and as it matures to become a fat cell, um, it, it's more and more uh, fat, fat droplets are going to occur. And so, more of so there's not only more stem cells, but more of them are on their on their way to uh, even even in the stem cells that you select from lipedema versus non-lipedema, they're on their way to becoming fat cells, uh, a greater proportion of them, and that's just you know th this so you, you so each of the stem cells has more fat droplets, and and uh, then the and and uh, <clears throat> compare in the lipedema versus the non-lipedema. And now if you, they also looked at cell cycle genes. Um, and there's a, there's, uh, as you can see on the right, there's, there's a, a, a variety of, uh, there's, uh, you know, seven or eight um, cell cycle genes and they're all upregulated. These are obviously, um, in the lipedema fat, and these are obviously the, the genes that are responsible for division and proliferation of a uh, of the tissue. And one of them they um, they 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 focused on was the Bub one gene. Um, so uh, and and Bub one gene, I mean, they because it's 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 involved in other diseases they. You know, they gave that some special interest, but it, I, I don't, we don't know. No one knows exactly. Um, you know, uh, it could be any of these, or or. There, but there's, but the the important things are that if you look the if you looking at the um, the genes in in from uh, from stem cells uh, from lipedema tissue. They're they're turned on in those and those uh, cells will proliferate even um, even in response even when they're given the same nutrition they're gonna they're they're gonna they're gonna proliferate in 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 um, in the culture wells um, compared to non lipedema um, fat so uh, so the ad Adipocytes and their stem cells from lipedema fat are structurally different and behave differently. Um, if given the same nutritional support, 
they're going to proliferate. Um, and and so there's a different cell biology of lipedema, um, and this leads to hyperproliferation of fatty tissue and may explain the disproportionate uh, growth uh, in 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 the adipose tissue of uh, of lipedema. Um, and so, but you know, we still don't know. So this this biology, I think, is. I think really, really well demonstrated, but we don't know if that's because of a genetic difference or is it, you know, is it, is it a bad cell or does it live in a bad neighborhood? And um, so we, that's, that still remains to be uh, seen. So, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, um, uh, about surgical treatment of lipedema, um, and there's a lot of there's there's multiple things we can surgical treatments for lip, lipedema, but the, most of it's going to really on what I call lipedema reduction surgery, or what we we like to call lipedema reduction surgery, which is a derivative of liposuction. But there's also skin reduction, removal, and manual extraction of of lipedema nodules. So when to consider surgery? I, I mean, I, I can't, I, I have to echo what uh, Karen said. You, it, surgical treatment should really be cons considered only after uh, conservative measures, including uh, compression use, diet, um, and weight loss, uh, or, you know, it, it, um, ha have been done. You're, you've gotten your inflammation under control. You've gotten it under control with by 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 supporting your lymphatics, by diet, um, by manual lymph drainage, and possibly intermittent uh, uh, compression pumps. So who's a good candidate? Well, obviously, lipedema patients. Uh, lipedema is a fat disorder, and, and lipedema ladies, even 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 a, a very healthy lipedema lady, is going to ha have a. a uh, uh, an increased BMI compared to someone without lipedema, um, but so uh, so we have to we 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 have to be give we have to be more we're more liberal in what how large a, a lady we might do surgery on. Um, but once you get to really larger BMIs, BMIs of 50 or um, the the um, proportion of them that have just from their weight have a secondary lymphedema. So 90% of women with BMIs of 50 are going to have a secondary lymphedema just uh, as a result of their 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 comorbid obesity or their uh, their weight. Um, you know, Dr. Herbst is is, is you know very strong proponent of waist to hip ratio because that's a better measure for a lipedema lady um, than than BMI of their overall you know uh, relative um, health and, and fat mass so we would we might we might be more liberal um, if they have um, waist waist to hip ratio less than one um, and and they should be compliant with the diet and either weight neutral or, or, or having weight loss before the, the surgery. Compliance with compression because it makes no sense to. So if you do surgery, you're gonna. I mean, you're gonna make the swelling worse at least for a short period of time, and you have to have good compliance with compression and overall fair to good health. Obviously, we can we eat some health. Uh, this, this is medically necessary, so it's not we we don't you don't have to be in excellent health because sometimes just the lipedema can can impair your health. So, uh, but but um, you know there we want we want um, a good good health is 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 recommended. So liposuction is a cosmetic procedure. It's one of the most common cosmetic procedures. And it's focused on optimal removal of fat for aesthetic or uh, aesthetic results. And derivatives of liposuction are increasingly used for surgical treatments of lymphedema and lipedema. So I'm going to talk a little more about that. So what 
lipedema reduction surgery is not liposuction. It's, obviously, it's not. It's, the goal is not a cosmetic improvement. The goal is to focus on pain relief, uh, functional improvement. Um, it and it removes larger volumes. Um, so uh, it is not. I mean, I regularly remove five to twelve liters of aspirate. Whereas in a cosmetic liposuction, I might you know one two maybe three liters of, of aspirate is removed. Um, it's performed on larger patients. Obviously, the average BMI of my lipedema patients is about 42. Um, and um, whereas a cosmetic patient, you know, we're, BMI is around 25. Larger areas are treated. So uh, we're, you know, we're also often treating, you know, you know four or five uh, what would be considered cosmetic surgical areas. Um, in one lipedema reduction surgery. There are longer procedures. The average total procedure time is around four to six hours. And, um, and then there's measures to protect lymph, lymphatics. Uh, and we're going to get into that a little more. So it's, we're not just extracting uh, fat. We're obviously fibrous tissue and, and extracellular glycosaminoglycans um, are also targeted. Um, now, um, the uh, benefits of lipidema reduction. So, so these uh, have been shown in multiple case studies. Um, it improves gait and stance, reduces pain, reduces need for compression and MLD, and uh, can reduce the stage or halt progression. Um, and those, this has really all been, I mean, I, I really I have to thank our my European colleagues for this. Uh, this, these, these are all things that have been shown um, by uh, my colleagues in Europe. So um, I, so I'm gonna. This is so I also have been following and trying to add to our knowledge about what kind of health effects um, lipedema reduction surgery can do. And so we we used. Uh, RAND SF36, to, it's a patient reported outcome using multiple d domains of health. And then uh, also the PROMISE, which is a, um, an NIH, uh, National Institute of Health, uh, developed tool um, that um, for uh, patient reported outcomes and such as mobility. And then these are these measures are used in a, a, a wide variety of diseases and, and, and can kind of so we can kind of compare the effectiveness of, of lipidema reduction surgery to other um, uh, treatment of other diseases with, uh, with surgery. So this is, uh, we, we see here that there's um, starting out before surgery, uh, the physical functioning uh, of our lipidema patients is, is below the mean population and and after surgery measured about six six to eight weeks out um they're they're in they're uh, have come to normal so that's a uh, one or two standard deviation um improvement um the role and physical functioning also improves role of energy and fatigue uh, you know significantly improved um uh Social functioning and 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 pain uh, improved, overall general health improved, um, and across the midline. This is it. This is the same kind of data, though, just graphed out, and you can kind of see that there's you know a a, a on on all the all the health domains there's an improvement, and this is similar. This is this this these kind of changes in health. Uh, 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 in these health in these health domains, um, you know, can be compared to uh, the effects of for people with chronic back pain in having back surgery. So chronic back pain uh, um, um, also suppresses their physical function, role function, and 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 the improvements we see from the lipedema reduction surgery are actually as good or uh, in some on some domains uh, quite a bit better than what, than the improvements seen from uh, treating uh, chronic back pain with back surgery. 
so now looking at the promise data, we can see, you know, we're seeing a 15% increase in ability to walk at normal speed, an 18% increase in ability to up, go up and down stairs, um, ability to get up from the floor um, without help, ability to run a short distance, and ability to stand for an hour. Um, and, and all those uh, changes are, are, are significant. So comparing using the PROMISE data, which is also used on many different uh, diseases and treatments, um, we can see that the lipidemia reduction surgery um, improves. Uh, so this is a normalized value, so uh, goes up 10 points, which is you know, over, over, a, over a standard deviation. And um, what is, um, these changes are, are are uh, so a, a two to three point change is considered minimally clinically important change in healthcare, and that I mean that's um, so for comparison a knee a knee a total knee replacement for someone who has you know uh, end stage uh, degeneration of their knee and gets a a, a, a replaced knee gets a, a three point to a five point uh, improvement using the same promise uh, uh, measures. We also see improvements in um, knee range of motion. So this is this uh, picture here shows a, um, how we measure the knee flexion or range of motion and inflection of a knee. And then we also see an improvement in valgus rotation and um, and decreasing Q angle improvement in gait in 84% of the patients. So um, so lipedema reduction surgery and lymphatic reduction. We we know that lipedema patients have impaired lymphatic function um, and extra care should be taken. So there's a lot, so some, I mean, it's really variable. Some surgeons don't take any extra precautions and some, some do. I, I do all of the, these precautions. We, I, I preoperatively map venous and lymphatic structures. I use small cannulas, only blunt cannulas. I don't use additional energy. I don't, I use longitudinal techniques and uh, multiple positions. So they, they pretty much, uh, the, the type of the, Lipidemia reduction surgery, they're rotating around 360 degrees uh, for, um, so they're all, every different, every different angle and position they're held in to, to get um, the uh, optimal uh, placement of the cannulas. So this is sort of a cautionary tale. This is a, a patient that presented to me, uh, she had lipidema and she had a uh, and she had um, developed after her surgery uh, some swelling in her right foot, and um, uh, this is her lymphocinogram. And um, I actually think I reversed the anterior and posterior, but it's but, but you can see here that the um, the uh, the right the right the right foot um, or the on the right the um, the lymph the radioactive uh, colloid does not go up, um, and it, so there's there's impaired lymph flow um, at, at 30, 75, and 90 minutes, um, and so uh, and there also so, shows some mild dermal backflow, whereas the uh, left leg is more normal, and you can see even within 30 minutes the uh, the uptake is already to the groin and and. Um, where where it should be, um, and so I mean, and you know, even at 90 minutes uh, in the right leg, it has not gone up into those uh, to those lymph nodes. Uh, insurance coverage for lipidemia. So it, many policies are contradictory. It's really um, while many they have while there are policies that cover it, they're they're. Um, the reimbursement for it is is all over the place. It's very very little, highly inconsistent. Um, one of the problems is it's coded with a cosmetic um, procedure code in, in, in the U.S. Uh, we have a there. It's so because it's a cosmetic. So the policies use a cosmetic code, 
which I think is wrong um, and should be a, a should have its own CPT code. Um, uh, this there's really no official because the official uh, all the official procedures that that for insurance and medical disease are are um, go through an uh, what our AMA and health department creates a, a a an official description. Well, that doesn't exist for the the cosmetic code that they that, ins that our insurance carriers in the United States assign to this, um, and so because. So there's no, it doesn't describe the time, skill, risk involved, doesn't really, I mean, so they, you can get a, um, a cosmetic liposuction, which is one or two hours and maybe re removes a, a liter or two and um, is, is a much simpler and, and, and uh, uh, less, there's less risk involved. There's all, uh, it's, it, there's um, there's a huge uh, they can they can they can say that's you know they the carrier our insurance carriers can can decide whatever they want to call whatever they want to pay for that and so it's very um, it it's very problematic at this at this point of course we hope it gets better um, I think that's I, I was going to I put some more slides in here, but I'm not going to do them because I wasn't sure whether um, Dr. Herbst well, I, I wasn't sure how much time I was going to do. Um, and so uh, I'm going um, to. I'm going to um, stop here and um, and turn it back over to our um, our um, our hosts. Thank you very much. Super nice presentation. Super interesting. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. I mean, I, I mean, what a thank you, and thank you for including us in the uh, in this lipedema awareness. We we really, you know, this is this is so wonderful. I, th I think what you have just covered is quite overwhelming <laughs> to, uh, to take it all in, but it's it's wonderful how it's been backed up by so many facts and studies, because I think this is key, isn't it, Valeria, to pooling this knowledge of information, because sometimes a new study comes up, and I know even just looking after our website, it's hard to keep up with the latest one, and sometimes interpret a very detailed study to know what steps forward we've made through that study. So I think you've both done a, a brilliant job of, of explaining some very technical stuff to us. Um, I think we've got, had quite a few questions come in, Valeria, haven't we? Do you want to kick off with the first one? Yeah. Yes, yes. Just uh, just one thing in, uh, in, in the chat of our socials on YouTube, you will find the link uh, to the survey Dr. Herbst prepared. So would you please fill in? I'm sorry, we have also another problem in the chat. So if you see some inappropriate messages, it's not us. We are being hacked. So we do apologize for, for this. And uh, for the next webinar, we will manage to solve this. So uh, we are sharing all uh, the link to the questionnaire in, uh, in all the socials. We will make stories on Instagram about this. So please fill in this questionnaire. And uh, for the questions, we have plenty, but I see that a very big hot topic is uh, hypermobility. I'm reading a, a question coming from Lipedema UK, a, a patient from Lipedema UK that is asking about uh, the relationship between hypermobility and Lerdalo syndrome and lipedema. She asks how much of this laxicity of cells and junctions in lipedema could be attributed to the comorbidity of uh, hypermobility or alert downloads, or is uh, lipedema itself? That's a really great question. So nobody knows the answer to that, but it could be that if you have a connective tissue disease, including ehlers danlos that can definitely weaken the connections between cells and contribute to the leakiness. Absolutely. 
but in the paper that we looked at today, um, what they did was they took normal, quote unquote, normal, so non-lipedema endothelial cells, and they took fluid from lipedema cells and put it onto the normal cells. And they they began and the the normal cells began to leak. So it may be that there's something else um, that's going on in lipedema besides a connective tissue disease. So it I think I think when I when I'm thinking about a connective tissue disease, I think that it actually can cause a worsening of lipedema. It can cause um, lipedema to, ad to advance to a higher stage, or it can cause a greater amount of pain, or it can cause a greater amount of disability. But, you know, again, we're still in early stages. This is just, you know, we're, we're just talking here that that's not, there's no final proof for what I just said. Could, could I ask a very basic question, which probably is, I don't know if it's inappropriate or not, but when children do gymnastics, when they're young, the girls are very flexible. Mm -hmm. If you suspect that there is lipedema in the family or mothers are concerned about it, is that a best to avoid situation or is it, or is it nothing to worry about? You know, if people are going to be stretching their joints, and I mean, mm -hmm. I have grandchildren who are just doing gymnastics right. all over the place. So, right. um, you know, is, is it, is it, a little bit of a danger area for them to go into when they're young, sort of before puberty, or or would you have no concerns about that? Well, I I mean, I remember when I was a young girl and we would be outside and we would do the craziest things, you know. Mm -hmm. So basically, it, it seems to me like what we're saying is kids that have hypermobile joints shouldn't be doing anything really, you know. They should be sitting inside or playing, you know. Which I don't, I don't, I don't think that I don't think there's good data for that. What I think there is good data for is that if you have, for example, hypermobile joints or and your ankles, you know, you can, your ankle just doop to the side, you know, you walk and boop, and then you're and then you stand right back up and you keep going. You go, I'm fine. Whereas somebody else, if their ankle went like that, it would have sprained horribly. Oh yeah. So, um, I I don't want to restrict um, girls with hypermobile joints or with a risk for lipedema from playing and doing all the things that they should do because I think the more they exercise as kids, the better. The more they sit in front of a computer, the worse. So at this point, I don't think we can say that. Although it might be good if you have a um, gymnastics instructor to say, you know, go up to them and say, hey, by the way, my, my daughter is very, she has hypermobile joints. Um, I just wanted to make you aware, you know, can you keep an eye on her? Because some things that, you know, some things you shouldn't do for hypermobile joints. And, you know, there's physical therapy books out for EDS. But again, how many people are going to be like prof professionals who know EDS really, really well? Okay. So I think say good research. research. Yeah, we need more research. We really yeah. do. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, do we have other questions from? Uh, I have actually an interesting one. Let me let me read it because it's uh, the question of the century. Because it's asking: Is there any evidence concerning the difference between normal adipose cells and lipedema fat cells? So how can we distinguish this lipedema fat from normal fat? Uh, what are the latest evidences for this? It's something that our, our patients uh, often ask us uh, and we do not provide the answer because we do not know it. I mean, we, there's, clearly, there's clearly biological differences in the fat cells of, of, of lipedema and, and and in the tissue and the t and all the surrounding tissue so um, I, I I think I think we have to say there is there clearly is a, a difference in that um, um, for sure um, I, I it's not fully understood all the differences but but there there are enough that we have to say that it it's different. 
Okay, uh, what is, I would uh, agree with that. I, I think that on the molecular level, it's become clear that you can differentiate between lipidema tissue and non-lipidema tissue and, and many different parameters. So if we age and body mass index match controls to lipidema and then we take their tissue, you can absolutely tell a difference in the, the amount of immune cells that are in the tissue, the type of lipids that um, are in the tissue, as Dr. Wright showed, the ability to form new fat cells, the secretion of fat cell hormones. So it is definitely different. But clinically, when you look at a woman with lipidema, you cannot say, oh, here's a little area, or it's very difficult to say, here's an area that is not lipidema, here's an area that is lipidema. And we know from the lim lymphedema world that in, in a single arm, so in an arm, let's say this arm has lipidema, there are going to be areas where you have lip lymphedema and areas where you do not. So it's kind of mixed in there. And we think the same thing happens with lipidema. If you take a woman with lipidema and she, you put her on a keto diet, she responds really well, she can lose fat from her legs, right? There's there's fat that's responsive to diet in the legs of some women with lipidema. I will not say all. And that means that there's a mixture of some lipidema and non-lipidema tissue there. But but um, we really don't have an image modality that can differentiate between them. Even ultrasound, you can't. You, can't, you can tell, yes, it's lipidema. It looks like lipidema or it doesn't. But you can't say, oh, here's an area and here's one that's not. And it's very difficult. I would just add, so I would add exactly, I agree completely with Karen, but I would add also like, you know, on, on physical exam, I mean, we, we look for like a nodularity or, or you know, in, in the area, but you, so you know, there's lipidema in that area, but on just, just by touching or looking at someone, you can't tell which, which which cells are, are going to have lipidema those are only you can only you can only tell that by if you look at the gene expression or histolog i mean under a microscope or something like that so all right i i have a question about um histamine and antihistamines uh, would you recommend in any way taking antihistamines as a routine medicine for somebody who has lipidema? The only uh, women I would recommend antihistamines for are in women who have signs and symptoms of excess histamine. So there's a, um, there's a really good paper by Dr. Larry Afrin published in 2016 and his, uh, I'll pull it up, maybe I can share it, but his first table shows a lot of the signs and symptoms of mast cell activation disease. And if you can go, there's also a questionnaire available online where you can go through and you can answer a whole bunch of questions to see if you have um, what looks like mast cell activation disease. And in those patients, um, I would consider it. And what Dr. Um, Afrin recommends is that you actually get tested first. Um, because you want to know if you really have it. Otherwise, you're looking at lifelong antihistamine treatment when you may not really need it. And then secondly, if you really have um, mast cells that are over-responsive, they may actually be over-responsive to another ingredient in the antihistamine. So when you take it, you feel worse. And you say, oh, this didn't make me better. This made me worse. But really, if you're working with somebody <clears throat> who knows mast cell disease, they can um, recommend a different antihistamine and, and then a different one and then a different one until you find one that actually works for you. So and, and who, who would you go to to help you through that process other than the questionnaire you mentioned? Because, again, this is a very complicated thing for your very complicated. Get, get through the healthcare provider. Um, so you would you would want to go to an allergist or allergy allergy immunology specialist right. who has an interest in mast cells some allergists don't care okay that's very helpful <laughs> if you really think that's an avenue that would help you so yes yeah, so you, you, yeah. you do think an allergy yeah, yeah. If you do think you need antihistamines absolutely it could help you but you definitely need to work with someone 
Okay, that's really helpful. Super. And um, I have uh, a question actually that is not kindly medical, but uh, some advocates uh, in, the, um, in the introductory questionnaire asked uh, in your opinion about the issue of uh, renaming lipedema. You know, there is a group of scientific people that is uh, proposing a change in the name of our disease. So what's your point of view in the renaming lipedema issue? Do you agree or not? I'm asking Robert. Yeah, I, I think we are we are making such great strides right now in understanding lipedema that why are we renaming it right now? Let's just wait a little bit longer so that we can really understand the pathophysiology. Like I doubt any of the. I should go look, but um, I just don't think it. Right now, I'm not ready to rename it. First of all. Um, part of the renaming process was because they don't believe that there is edema and lipedema. And one of the papers that, um, since I focus on inflammation today, I didn't focus on edema, but uh, Shelly Krasinski from Vanderbilt University just came out with a paper um, using magnetic resonance imaging or MRI to find fluid in the tissue. And she found that in 75% of women with lipedema, you can see interstitial edema. And that's what we've been saying is present all along. There were also um, uh, some women, especially those with lipolymphedema who had diffuse edema, suggesting that um, you know there's free fluid and interstitial um, bound fluid. So I, I do think there's edema and lipedema. So why are you renaming it because it's lip? edema. And then secondly, we're, we're getting so close to the pathophysiology. Let's figure it out and then rename it for what it really is rather than renaming it now and then naming it again. Yeah, that seems sensible to me. <laughs> so maybe, maybe what we could do is we could say lipedema, also known in Germany as blah, 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 blah. And that's probably yeah. what I think we're going to do and not, you know, it just depends on what the name ends up to be. And it is painful, and I know they want to include something about pain in the name, and I think that's appropriate. And hopefully they'll keep the lipo part, but we'll see. Okay. Tom? I would also, I'd like to add, add in there. I mean, I think actually, it's, I mean, it's as, it's as apt, a descript, apt a name as, there, as we can find. I mean, every, every name change is going to have some some downsides, but but it is a it is a, a lipomatosis, so it's lip, and it's not edema. So I mean, um, and I think you know, I mean, we so and 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 uh, I mean, not every lady with lipedema, you know, in the original studies had pain. So I don't think I, I think I don't think right now there is a better name than lipedema. Okay. So I, I had a, a comment from a healthcare professional in the UK who was very interested in your um, your suggestion to checking fatty livers, fat, if you have a fatty liver. So again, that's something for people to maybe mention. Again, where would they go to for that if, if you don't have a really good clinician who's up in lipedema? Yeah, so at, at least here in the U.S., primary care providers can order an ultrasound of the, the abdomen. And it's a they just have to order the right side of the abdomen. So it's a very inexpensive, very quick, non-invasive exam. So any primary care provider should be able to do it. And I, I think you need to find some pathology of the liver before you would refer them to a specialist. Like if you don't even know if there's anything wrong with the liver, I don't think that that patient would even get accepted by a gastroenterologist. So what you could, I mean, basically uh, what a patient can say to their provider is, I have a lot of fat on my abdomen. I have a lot of lipedema tissue. Lipedema is, a, in, is an inflammatory condition and so is obesity. I'm really worried that I have fatty liver. Okay, so that's another one. Another one yeah. to investigate. Yeah. Yeah. And I think if you say I'm very concerned 
if I have a fatty liver, then I may have insulin resistance. This may make my lipedema worse. Can you help me? Can you just ultrasound my liver? Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's another Isn't one. That the yeah. standard of care for evaluating the liver is a right upper quadrant ultrasound. Yes, it is. And okay. even, let me just say this though, even thin people or thin looking people can have fatty liver. This is not, fatty liver is not restricted just to people who have excess adipose tissue. So if you um, are concerned in any way that you may have metabolic disease of any kind or prediabetes, um, I would not hesitate to ask for that right upper quadrant ultrasound of the liver because it is an inexpensive exam. Okay, thank you. So I think we have just a few minutes for um, the last two questions, the very last two. Um, this is interesting because one <clears throat> one person is asking, what about the impact of contraception on lipedema, especially the combined pill or the mini pill in young women? <coughs> so I can tell you this just right off the bat that Lupron or injected, um, you know, long acting uh, progesterone can actually make a woman with lipedema worse because it actually creates inflammation. So I would say Lupron is probably not the best choice unless you absolutely have to, you know, and, and that's between you and your healthcare provider. It is likely that contraception can make lipedema worse, but we have no data at all, no data at all. And the question is what, you know, if you take a, a contraceptive pill that has high levels of hormones versus a contraceptive pill that has low levels of hormones, what's gonna be the difference there? And what I've seen in my practice is when women go on contraception, they gain a little weight and then they stay stable for a long period of time. And then when they go off the contraception, they gain a little weight. And it's not a huge amount, but it is, you know, I mean, any weight is, you know, no one likes to gain weight, um, gain fat on their body. So I think while you're on the contraception, as long as you, you know, are stable and on, are the on the lowest dose you can, I don't think there's a lot of issue it's just going on and coming off. So anytime you change your hormones in your body, that's when your body wants to, to change things up and put on weight. But there may be women out there who gain a ton of weight when they go on contraception. We're all different. We don't know. And there's there are people who are doing research on estrogen now and lipedema. So hopefully within the next year or two, we'll know a little bit more and can answer that question better for you. Thanks. That's encouraging. <laughs> That's good news. Sherry, do you want to ask the last question? Very, very um, well, I'm just very concerned about the time. I don't quite know how we're going yes, to Yes, yes, I, yes. I, um, you know, again, uh, the, the questions about MRIs, and I, th I think all the, all the information you've given us, and the wonderful thing is this has been recorded, so people can go over your slides over and over again and really absorb which information is best for them and how they can use it. And as you say, the more information that comes out, the more we can have that wonderfully explained to us, <laughs> the better yeah. it will be, yeah, and, and healthcare providers. Um, I think that those are all my questions, actually, Valeria, yeah. given the time we have. Yes, yes. And uh, just let me spend just a few words to thank you, to thank you for the, the, the huge gift you gave us today to spending your time together with us, with other healthcare professionals, with we patient advocates and with all the patients that are listening to you. So thank you very much for staying with us and uh, for this amazing gift to all of us. Thank you. We thank you most sincerely. Thank you so much. We really appreciate all you do for the Lipedema Commit community, both of you. I know you work so hard. I've, as you know, we, we talk a lot and you, I've never seen two people work harder in my life. So thank you so very much. Happy Lipedema Awareness Month to everyone. And thank you for everyone from hanging on and staying. And for those who watch in the future, I hope you enjoyed. Mm -hmm.
Thank you, Catherine, Karen. Thank you. I, I think actually you beat us hollow in the work ethics. <laughs> You're everywhere. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's an honor and a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Really, really helpful. Thank, Thank you both, both for staying with us. us. <laughs> Let's do <laughs> <it>. everybody. Because <laughs> working together, we can make a change. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming today. And please share all this information. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody.